Welcome today to our um, Leighton Museum Lecture Series. Today I've been asked to introduce our speaker and I am pleased to be able to introduce Jerry Stevenson. He, when I asked him the other day how he would like to be introduced, he said, just introduce me as an onion farmer. <laughs> Jerry Stevenson grew up in Leighton on an onion farm and learned to work hard on that farm. He um, has lived in Leighton all his life, except for while he attended college. Jerry and his beautiful wife, Sue, have five children and 23 grandchildren. And with the support of his family that have helped him through the years, he served for seven years on Leighton City Planning Commission, eight years on Leighton City Council, and, or sorry, yes, eight years as Leighton City Council member and 12 years as mayor. After taking time off from elected office to be a bishop for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for the last 11 years, he has served as a Utah State Senator from the Leighton area. I think that we are fortunate to have um, such a good person here today to do the history of Leighton. His subject is the history of Leighton City, and I think he's an excellent choice to give that to us. Please welcome Jerry Stevenson. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joyce. That's a, uh, that's a great introduction. I've, uh, I've had the opportunity, uh, I, I am a businessman by, by trade and I have, uh, have several things I'm involved in, but I own the J&J &J Garden Center and we do a lot of other things in the, in the community. But we've always been very active in the community and active in, in community politics. I appreciate very much this opportunity. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Councilman. We thank you, I thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity. This has been a, a real opportunity for me to dive into the history of not, not only of Leighton City, but of my family. Because my family came here in 1852, my great, great grandfather, and settled down on Case Creek, uh, right almost on the boundary between Leighton and Caseville. And uh, so we've been in the mix of the, of the foundations of Leighton City since the very beginning, and we've going on five generations now. So it's been, a, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to be here. I will tell you that this is an amazing community. Uh, there are some things that this community has about it that we all ought to be very proud of as a city and as, as citizens here, and that is that we're very thrifty. This community does not owe a lot of money uh, we bond. If we bond, we bond very fiduciary. We're very careful about how we do that. It's well managed and, and we have always had a reputation for electing people that are service oriented uh, to solve our problems for us. I'd like to, I'd like to start out uh, and maybe talk a little bit. I've got a, we have a slide presentation we're going to do here. And I'm, I, I want to talk a little bit about the very foundations of the city because we always have not been latent. Uh, we, we were Kaysville at one time. We were part of, uh, when the area was first settled, we were part of the, uh, the Kays, uh, Kays Ward. And in the, in the LDS world, that's, uh, that's the boundary that was set for the community. It was set, I think it's about five square miles. Uh, it, says, it says five miles, but it's square miles. And it would have extended from just south of downtown Kaysville uh, which means that we were, we need to, it would have, would have meant that we were in just south of Kaysville, approximately where Davis High is, and north to Antelope Drive, or just a little past Antelope Drive. That was the boundaries of the Kays Ward, and that was the boundaries of where we as a, as a community, or as, as the Kays Ward was uh, established, a farming area with the downtown being what is now Kaysville. Kaysville City proper. There's there's just some amazing things here. If you look at it, I think I think these maps are up, and it's going to be hard. I'm going to tell you some things about these maps. I had the good fortune of being able to blow them up on my on my computer and look at them very in detail. And there's some things on those maps that just don't catch your eye if you just take a look at it. Uh, look at it from the from the uh, outset. Uh, let me go to the second slide. Well, let me tell a little bit about this first one, uh, the, the first slide, and I'm going to have to grab my, 
laptop. I've, uh, you'll find that uh, there's two things I don't do well. One's PowerPoint, and the other is Zoom. So we're probably in, in a, a bad part of my world right now. Uh, if we go back and we look at, let's go back to the first slide and just spend just a minute or two there. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get there or not. I've, uh, oh, come on. Okay, we're there. Uh, the first settlers that came to what is now Leighton and Kaysville. They established farms and homes along the banks of two major mountain streams, Holmes, uh, or excuse me, Holmes Creek and Kays Creek. Now, if you look at, at the map that's behind me, you can see those mountain streams and how they came out of the mountains. And it's, it's really interesting because pay close attention to those streams because they were the lifeblood of the community. This is a desert climate we live in. And if you look at those streams, they go from the mountain to the lake, and it's perfectly natural for people to build along those corridors. There were other wells and things that popped up or things that were flowing wells, and then people were able to dig them in other places, but not very many. <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to point out is that if you go to Case Creek and go north about as far as the water would stretch, which would be slim because you'd have a lot of people wanting to share that, especially in the, in the fall of the year when there's little water in that stream. The next drainage system, if you go north, is the Weber River. There is no drainage that comes off the mountain between those two points. And that's, that plays very heavily into what we're going to talk about here today and into these, uh, uh, why the communities developed the way they did and why they separated. The other thing I would like you to look at is look very closely at the map we have up there of Kaysville City, which is would be the map uh, on my left. It's that map that was laid out on a grid and it was laid out by Brigham Young. They sent a team up here to actually survey crew that measured, marked that community out in 1854. That's about six or seven years after the pioneers arrived in the valley. It was recognized it was great farmland up here and people were looking for places to expand. So that was in 1854, that was when that expansion took place. And the street grid is laid out and that's still the core of Leighton or of Caseville City today. You don't see that in Leighton and we'll talk about that why or why that is in just a few minutes. So in, in March of 1868, Caseville City incorporated and they, uh, they filed a calculation and they actually incorporated clear to that line on Antelope Drive. That was part of Caseville City at one time, which is, uh, is rather interesting because not, not wasn't long after that, there started to be a feud against those that were lived in the downtown section or the grid area of Caseville and those that in Leighton City or in what turned into Leighton, which was part of the Kays Ward uh, on the on the north end of the community or the north side of Kaysville. Uh, let's go to the next the next map we have here. This is so the separation actually they they coexisted until about um, well it didn't coexist. There were a lot of battles going on, but they were very small. But there began to be a business district built in what is now Main Street Gentile area in Layton. And as that started to build, uh, I, I thought often about a, a professor that I had in college that used to tell me, when it's not the money, it's the principle of the thing, it's always the money. And that's what happened here. There was, uh, you had a large area to the north and, and people would have to go through that to get to the business district in Kaysville. And so I think there was some jealousy on money being siphoned off and, and uh, it, and then the main pathway between Kaysville or between Salt Lake City and Ogden was really south. Or, or excuse me, not south, but west. And it went down uh, almost through um, 
Sunset Drive, where Sunset Drive is now in Kaysville. And so it was easier to get to a Leighton business district than it was a Kaysville business district. And so that's, there was really some, some deep-seated uh, issues that came together I've, I've, uh, and caused these communities to not want to be together all the time. In 1868, Kaysville Incorporated, the incorporation application, as I said, included clear up the Antelope Drive. These maps show how the population of the city looked, and, and that's the maps we have up here. If you could blow this map up, the one in, uh, would be in my lower left or your lower right. Right down in the very corner, there's a place in Kaysville, and I think it, it is directly west. If you followed 200 north in Kaysville west, clear out to the far west side, it comes on to what we used to call Schick Lane. And in that very corner of that map, it says Crazy Corner. And, and then it defines Crazy Corner as you would have to be crazy to live here. I thought that was, uh, that was quite entertaining, but if you look at those maps in detail, that isn't the only place someone has put their own interpretation into what's going on in the area. Uh, we have, uh, so if, if you, anyway, you look at the population here and you look at the grid system, the roadways, and then after 18 area, this, we started to develop, or after 1880, we started developing a business section or business uh, area here in Layton City and this downtown area that we talked about. And it's really a triangle. And there's a lot of things that caused that to happen. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up and I wanted to make sure everyone understands really well is if you, if you go north of Case Creek, as I mentioned, there's really nothing, there's no other drainage, there's no other natural water other than a few wells until you get to the Weber River. So as a result, that was uh, that area developed into just grazing land, and there was nothing there until they figured out how to get some water here. In 1869, there was a canal company put together that actually went broke, and it was to take surplus water from the Weber River and bring it around the north end of what we now call Hill Air Force Base, or what was uh, the Sand Ridge. They brought that around and that was, they brought water in, but it, didn't, it wasn't a reliable source. Uh, so you find that there was things, the crops that were grown that could only be grown in a very short period. That's, that canal company didn't last very long, they went bankrupt. So then the Davis Weber Canal Company formed for the same reason to bring that surplus water into this area. And I, I believe that was in 1889, I think that's correct. They brought that water in here in 1889, but that still wasn't a very reliable source because most of the water on the Weber River was being used by Summit County, Morgan County, and Weber County. And to get it over here was really difficult. They've built the East Canyon Reservoir in 1899, and that allowed storage of water, and that brought water into this area through the Davis-Weber Canal system. And that allowed the farming to change considerably. It was no, no longer the Sand Ridge. Uh, there was water then that came into Syracuse, uh, most of the, a lot of the Hooper area, uh, West Point, Clinton, uh, Sunset, which is a very small community, not a lot of agriculture, but, and uh, Clearfield. So that, that water came in, but didn't come until 1899, and that's a lot of the things we're gonna talk about now. But just keep that in mind, because that was, that was what was caused the real growth of the area of Layton. We had land mass that they did not have in the Kaysville area, and that's part of what I think this jealousy uh, was stimulated over. And then we also had water, and the water came in, and the, the canal terminates. There isn't a lot of Kaysville that was ever watered by the, uh, by the canal, but some. So there was, there was times we were getting along and times we were not. But um, there were five major roads were in Layton at the time. There was a territorial highway, which is what we call Highway 91 or Main Street through Layton. You had, uh, you had the Fiddler's Creek Road, or I think now that's mostly uh, Rosewood Lane in that Rosewood Lane area. And then you had Gentile Street and Angel Street and then Fort Lane went uh, went north. Fort Lane does not did not look like it does today. It was a little more. And I can remember when we changed Fort Lane, and, and it was uh, put a, put in as a main artery artery between uh, Highway 193 and Layton or Kaysville. 
So let's go to our next slide. And we find that a separation started again in 1889 and it happened for a lot of reasons. We're gonna talk about those reasons, which are some of them really have, uh, they're very interesting. Uh, as I went in the legislature, I, I looked at all the bills and all the laws that we have in the state and it seems like some of them don't make a lot of sense. And I call them barking dog bills. And I think this story fits very well with what we're going to get to in here, here in just a minute. But if you, have a, if you have a neighbor that's dog is barking, there are probably a lot of ways to solve that issue. Uh, you can talk to animal control or the city, or maybe you just ought to go talk to your neighbor. But in most cases, a lot of people are in a lot of cases, they'll just go get their le friendly legislature to run a bill that asks all the dogs in the state to be quiet. And, and I've, there's quite an analogy that can go with this, I think, as we start looking at, at uh, some of the things that have happened in this community. Uh, Kaysville did not like this booming, or this business district that was beginning here in Layton. And in Kaysville in 1882, you had, or in the Kays Creek, and it was not called Layton, it was called the Kays Creek Business District or Kays Creek Businesses. So we had four that were uh, booming up. Kaysville Farmers Union, Adams and Sons Market, uh, Bowler's Blacksmith, and the William Hyde uh, uh, General Mercantile. If you look at taxation, this is, I, I thought this was quite interesting because again, I have relatives and I've had access to some tax records that they have. And so you look at Kaysville's tax schedule, they were trying to tax this land mass that we talked about, this five square miles, but they only had five mills. Well, five mills isn't a lot of tax. And so some of these farms, you'd have a big farm in Layton in this time frame in 1885 to 1890. And those farms had very little valuation. You might have, you might have 80 or 90 acres that would be valued at three or $400. And that's all. So you look at five mills on that and it turns into not a lot of taxation but also they didn't have a lot of money for taxes. If you look at the Davis County business license fee schedule that I think we have up here now, uh, about the highest tax you could pay as a business owner in Davis County if you had $50,000 invested in your business, I'm not sure there were any. Uh, I've looked back, I've looked at some of the big agricultural operations in the county, and it was hard to come up with six, eight, ten thousand $10,000 worth of value. But you look at you look at a business that would have would have had capital over fifty thousand dollars, and their taxes would have been forty five dollars a year, plus the, the what Kaysville City tacked on uh, for mills and property. And I think if I'm reading that right, there's three dollars per year, or per year. And if you do one day of personal service as a road tax fee, I think they take that off of your taxes. So if you took your team and wagon and went out and worked on the roads in the county they would deduct your $3. Uh, this is when things started to get very precarious. There was a lot of uh, wrangling going on prior to 1881, but in 1881, Kaysville City initiated a dog license fee. And this became a real sign of trouble with what was going on because most of these people, remember, the, the complaint came because people, because dogs were running up and down the grid pattern in Kaysville or the gridded streets, the surveyed streets. No one cared what was happening up on Antelope Drive as far as dogs. And a lot of those individuals were in the sheep business. And the sheep business, you may have, you may own several dogs if you were in the sheep business. So as a result, uh, the Leighton residents just got together and decided they weren't going to pay a dog fee. They weren't going to pay for these dogs. And uh, the, because they didn't roam the streets of Kaysville, those dogs had a job. And so there was, uh, there was basically an outcry and they refused to pay, the, pay for the dogs. I found it very interesting because if you look at this, this is a dog license that was issued for a dollar. Uh, it was a large black dog, the tip of its tail and its underbelly was white. And uh, it answers to the name, I think that's Serge or Sergi. And uh, anyways, it was about two years old and it cost a dollar to license that dog. I don't know how many licenses they ever sold, but uh, 
I, I, you you got to think they had to sell quite a, sold quite a few to support a dog a dog catcher or animal control officer. If we if we look at when Kaysville incorporated, they put a a, a a city council together, and you know many of you will know these names. These names resonate in Davis County history, and they resonate in the history of this area. And many of us know their their uh, their posterity. And uh, they're good people, uh, I mean, amazing people, and they accomplished a lot. But it's, it's, it's quite interesting that I think it's worth reading those names. Had a city council, well, first of all, we had a, a mayor. Um, oh, excuse me, uh, on, the, on the Kaysville side, you had a, a city, Hiram Stewart was the mayor, uh, city council, James Linford, uh, Heber Sheffield, William Blood, uh, Lambert Blaymeyers, John W. Thornley, Frederick Burton, and Will Barnes. And then if we go to the Layton side, and it, it's very, it's, we, there's only two names that really keep popping up. Uh, that was uh, Ephraim or E.P. Ellison and Rufus Adams. Now, we all know descendants of both of those uh, individuals. Uh, there were a lot of others mentioned, but they did not come up in the newspaper on an often or on a real regular basis. And so this is the only two we brought up here today. But there, there are plenty of others. Then, if we go a little farther down the line, Caseville City decided they needed a city hall. Now, remember, we're, we're taxing or trying to tax Clear to Antelope Drive. And we've got a, a bunch of uh, folks that decided that wasn't a good idea, the taxed Antelope Drive. So they decided to issue a bond and build a city hall. That city hall is, uh, that's a picture of it that we have there. So they, they uh, bonded in 1889 for $5,000. Man, money doesn't go, like, go as far as it used to. But they built a city hall and they used this $5,000 bond, hired an architect that was located uh, on Third North and Third West in Kaysville, and I'm trying to I've tried to visualize where that is, but it's it would be, uh, I would think it's it's certainly west of Main Street, and a block north of what 200 where 200 North is now. So that's a, a it would probably be in the area west of where the old Albertsons used to be, or uh, west and a little north of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. There was a lot of objections and the people, you know, bonding was a pretty new concept and they didn't want to do that. And as a result, uh, they, as a result, a lot of folks uh, refused to pay it. They didn't want to pay the bond back. $5,000 was a lot of money. And Kaysville, as I said, they enacted a tax. And those in the Layton, and the Layton area was basically north of Holmes Creek of the North Fourth Fork of Holmes Creek. They refused to pay that bond. And so uh, re the assessed taxes, and because they considered themselves outside the city limits. The reason they considered themselves outside the city limits is Kaysville had a fire department and they also had a police department. But, you know, if you were uh, a few miles north, it was pretty hard to get those services. They were taking place on horseback and it took a long time. And they felt like they weren't getting any service and they shouldn't have to pay for it. So that's where this, this kind of went to from there. E.P. Ellison, he actually, he, he ran the Farmers Union here in Layton and he refused to pay the business and the property taxes. And uh, Kaysville decided that he had to pay them. And so they came to Layton and they took his horse and buggy, uh, took his horse and wagon. And they and they, uh, they actually put it up for sale for taxes, back taxes. And that's when things started really coming unraveled because he filed a lawsuit against Kaysville for $100 in damages and attorney fees. And uh, the suit claimed that there's no benefits and we shouldn't have to pay taxes. I think all of us have, uh, have ancestors that probably fought in a little war called the Revolution, Revolutionary War over the same reason. And uh, it's, it's real interesting to see how this kind of comes together later on. Um, so Ellison and Linford, they get into a battle with one another. 
and it goes to the Utah to territorial Supreme or territorial court. Remember, there's no state at that time. The state didn't exist until 1896. So um, the jurisdiction of Kaysville City was legal and valid as to the lands which cannot by any possibility be benefited by municipal government. To impose such a tax upon the lands is contrary to, the, uh, to that part of the Constitution which provides that private property shall not be taken for public purposes without just compensation. And to tax him would take away his property without just com compensation. Uh, it sounds a little bit like uh, uh, some of the things that, that people like Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, uh, Samuel Adams discussed when they when they found the roots of our country. So that's that's the uh, where this had gotten to. So anyway, that was a ruling that you couldn't do that. So Caseville appealed that to the territorial court and that the territorial court upheld the judge's decision. That isn't the end of why we separated, though. Um, I've got a I'm going to have to put on a pair of glasses here. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, we've got a, as this continues on, uh, we had this separation after the court really ruling in order not to discriminate uh, all taxation ceased of the Leighton area. And Caseville City had, seven, had a seven year revenue drought and in 1896, Utah gained statehood, which was very important as we look at the things that took place after that. Um, anyway, the bondholder that held the, the building on the Caseville City Hall that we looked at earlier, uh, they didn't make, the, they had a drought in taxes and they didn't make their bond payments on their City Hall. And it was actually, <clears throat> so the, I don't know, I've never seen any City Hall repossessed, but I've seen some, uh, and I don't, I, there's times you'd wonder who'd want one, so. But anyway, they had, they uh, they sued the city. The city made no interest payments and no principal payments. Um, so anyway, in the meantime, you've got business growth in both areas, and and then you've got a new uh, Utah State tax issue of uh, business licenses. Where, of course, Davis or Layton City was paying all their taxes to the county at that, or late. I keep saying Layton City, but there really was no city. It was just the Kays Business District was paying taxes to Davis County up to this time, um, but they refused to pay the Kaysville fees, license fees and everything else, and that's where this court, this court case came from. Then there was this drought, no money coming into Kaysville City coffers, City Hall is in trouble, and uh, then in 1899, there is another lawsuit, not in Layton and Kaysville, but in in Grantsville and uh, Tooele. And the state Supreme Court, uh, basically Tooele sued Grantsville and said, you owe us some money. You were providing services to you. You're not paying. And uh, the Supreme Court of the state of Utah uh, or the territorial court reversed its uh, ruling and, it, and then the controversy in Layton and Kaysville started all over again. And so Ellis, Ellison and Linford case uh, went not only it went to the U.S. or to the Utah Supreme Court, but it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now I had always heard that that's where this was decided, but it wasn't. That court, that case was never heard in the Supreme Court. They never listened to the U.S. Supreme Court. Never heard the case. So in this, this is uh, we get into some really. Uh, fun things here now. Uh, the population had grown in the area to that point that it was time for to have more than one LDS ward in the area. And so they formed the Kaysville Second LDS Ward. It was created with 50 families and it included this area, uh, a big piece of the area that was what they were considering Layton. And uh, that was in uh, 1992, and the members petitioned the church to not name a Layton area Kaysville. 
And there was a lot of animosity that went went toward that. And then in in uh, 1892, they officially changed the name to the West Layton Ward. The church did. And I thought it was rather interesting because the notes that I have said that that's probably one of the very few times in the history of the LDS church that the ward members got to pick the name that they wanted to go by. And so it became the West Layton Ward. And very interesting, I, I lived in the West Layton Ward, uh, lived in the boundaries my whole life. It had been split, but when through additional splits, they went back and took the West Layton Ward name and we actually lived inside that boundary for a long while. Uh, it's a, it, it's, um, Anyway, in March of 19, 1902, this is 13 years of disagreements, court cases, tax issues, and they finally got them resolved. And the area became an unincorporated part of Davis County. Uh, the taxes and business license fees paid to the county, but there's a lot of animosity and that carried on for a lot of years. Now, if I can get this up quickly, I wanna, I wanna read a newspaper article that's uh, a little bit, I have to blow it up and it's, it's, it's quite difficult to read because it doesn't blow up real clear, but I think you'll find this. Uh, this is when the, the final uh, uh, court decree came down, but a, a judge roll up, entered a decree in district court at Farmington this morning which materially reduces the uh, the extent tax the extent taxable uh, the extent taxable property and population of Kaysville. Until this morning, Layton has been a suburb of Kaysville, within the taxable limits, but uh, enjoying none of the benefits of fire and police systems. For the past 15 years, the citizens of Layton have objected to the conditions of things. They objected to paying taxes into a city treasury of Kaysville and, uh, and deriving no benefit thereof. And they say, this is really pretty fuzzy. Their indignation increased until uh, in this position, they were sustained by a decision of the Supreme Court, which held that the boundaries of the city could not extend farther than the protection of the fire and the police uh, systems. And the entities of Layton and uh, of, of Layton was given uh, one, uh, let's see, the, the citizens of Layton and one uh, fourth miles from Kaysville, one and a fourth miles from Kaysville. So that takes you almost to about to, to Hates Creek. So that it, and then it says that they went to that line, and so they took away from Kaysville, and it said it bounded, uh, the boundaries were not legally bounded to pay, the residents were not legally bounded to pay taxes, and to the late nights, uh, continued to hold uh, to their hard-earned shekels. That's in the article. It says, but the Supreme Court some time ago in Grantsville case revealed reversed its decision, and then the late nights found them they were owing about $1,000 for back taxes, and their property had been sold as delinquent. By this time, the citizens of Kaysville proper had become uh, weary of litigation, and they petitioned for the restoration of the city's boundaries. So went to court, in, in, uh, in territorial court, Kaysville lost, and now it goes back into, into state court. Layton City, Layton people also filed a similar petition. The commission was appointed and the agreement entered into in which the, uh, practic the practicality of uh, victory for the people of, or for which the, for which is practically a victory for the people of Kaysville as the separation of Layton took place according to a, a, pop, uh, a population uh, advised them by Judge, Judge Rollup and entered into decree accordingly. This is where, this is, I find this very interesting. The agreement is that the people of Layton pay all delinquent city taxes to Kaysville. I don't know that's a thousand dollars or more, but uh, then the, the, that Kaysville retains all the city property and assumes all liabilities that two sevenths, 
of the property of the, uh, of the uh, contested Layton district remain in the city and five sevenths in Layton. Now, I, I'm not sure where that property line was drawn, but it certainly left most of what we know today to be Layton City. Thus, the Layton proper is only five sevenths as large as the taxable uh, property and two thirds as large as the population. And then it tells who the attorneys were that handled this. Uh, when I was mayor, we had an interesting, there was, there was a piece of property that was included in Layton City, and it was on this side of Holmes Creek. And the mayor of Caseville came to me and he said, you know, uh, we have a business that would like to build on that property, but they have a name, the name of Kaysville in the name of their business. And we would like to annex that property into Kaysville. We'd like to have you disconnect it from Layton City and move it into Kaysville. And I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, you know, if that were, were residential property and I had a group of residents that wanted to do that, I may consider that. But I said, that's commercial property. And just between you and I, I don't care. I don't care what you call it as long as Layton collects the tax base, because business tax bases are very valuable and residential resident residential tax base is not valuable after a few years. So we 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 settled that one. And uh, that business is now in Layton and it has a Kaysville name and you can figure out who that is. <laughs> so uh, and just as kind of a footnote, this is this is funny that uh, Kaysville City Hall, uh, in 1889, the Kaysville City Hall was damaged beyond, oh, excuse me, it was, it was built in 1889, but it, in, in 1906, it was damaged by an east wind. Now, the only thing I could see that maybe happened there is that the spire they have on the top tipped over and took the roof out of the building, but it was damaged beyond repair, and... Uh, and the bill, they ended up taking the building down. And there was a lot of uh, discussion in Layton that that was poetic justice, that building uh, met the demise that it met. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna change gears here a little bit. That pretty well separates the communities, but I, I, I wanna just take a minute or two. And th this is part of the script that I was given. And I don't, we've got, I, I think I can do this in 10 or 15 minutes. And, I think we have uh, 20 minutes left. So mostly what was being grown in the area were grains. And of course, everyone had a big vegetable garden tied to their farm. Uh, I, you, I, I think it's hard for you to see, but the picture in the middle, I think they're picking beans. And there are, are some men in that picture and two of them, they have ties on. So apparently bean, bean picking was a great uh, a great trade at that time because they're they're dressed quite well, and I, I think I you may be able to see it. The, the one gentleman standing at the very back, but there there's two of them in that picture. They're wearing ties. It must have been a photo op. Um, but there became as soon as the water came into the area uh, in in the 1900 uh, 18 again East Canyon was built in 1889. But when the water got here, it became very, very prosperous in this area. There was some canning factories were built. Uh, there was the uh, um, uh, three, four flour mills, four flour mills, I think. And uh, of course, it, one of those pictures is a pea viner. There was a canning companies that opened up and they grew a lot of tomatoes. Uh, contrary to popular belief, tomatoes don't take as much water as people think they do. And uh, so there was a lot of tomatoes and, of course, other crops. And uh, this was uh, became a very prosperous farming area. I and, and I, I can speak to this because I'm still part of it. I really believe that the best farm ground in the state of Utah with adequate water is probably in Davis County, especially northern Davis County. Be and, and at one time at this time, it would have been very plentiful. So that's one of the reasons that we we had this uh, but what happens when you build a canning factory or you build a flour mill or a sugar factory, which came a little later, I think, in, in uh, 1915 and 16? But what happens? You create jobs and revenue and you create things that cause the community to prosper. Because when people have jobs, they're able to spend money and that money turns, it creates an economic multiplier 
and we see a lot of really good things happen. The other thing that I found was very interesting is that uh, a lot of, there's a lot of landmass. Kaysville lost two things when Leighton disconnected from them. They lost the landmass and they lost access to the water that came with it eventually. So in, in this community, we had, we had large, uh, there was two or three large uh, uh, cattle operations, ranching, uh, ranching operations. There was a lot of sheep were a big, big business. And then of course, after the, after the sugar factory started, there was a, the beets and so forth. And it was interesting how the values all came together. But the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is there was the horse business here was very big. And the U.S. military used to come here on an annual basis, and they would they would buy mounts for the military. Now, remember that even up until World War One, our military was riding a lot of horses, and so through this time period that we're talking about, there were a lot of horses bred, and uh, and and trained in the city of Layton, but the military would come here and buy horses and, and take them out of town. You would put, when the railroad came through, then you could put, uh, you'd put cattle on in a rail car and you'd ship them off to um, canning or manufacturing, not manufacturing, but canning, uh, packing plants all over the country. And uh, so a lot going on here. And uh, some of these pictures up here depict uh, the sheep business, pig business was big, cattle business, but we were a very prosperous community. But remember, now we've got water all the way from where the Davis Weber Canal comes through, uh, clear down to the lake. And that was uh, our, our ancestors should be complimented on that system that was put together. I don't think we could build that today because of some of the things going on in our society. But it has served us well for a long time. And, and it's, uh, I think, certainly been much appreciated by us. The business district grew. You can see there there's uh, there's uh, Levi Haywood Lumber, uh, Arthur Ellis, General Mercantile, First National Bank uh, came along in uh, 1905. Adams Brothers Meat Market. As a, as a kid, I remember shopping at the Adams store in, on Main Street in Layton and uh, didn't have quite a produce section like we can find now in stores, but very reliable and lots of good conversations. Layton Drug Company, uh, the Adams Building Enlargement, Ernst and uh, Leighton Hardware and Auto Repair. I've got another one here that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about an invoice that came with it. But that's the business district. That's not the grid they have in Kaysville. Uh, if you were going to come to the shop in Leighton, you saddled up your buggy or, uh, you know, through the middle of this period, you could start to get a vehicle so you could drive in. And you drove downtown or rode your buggy downtown. But... There was never a walkable business district that developed in Layton, where residents, very few, could walk to the to the stores. You had to come in, and, and of course, they by now, they start building out to the north, and so it became a, a major business district in the area because of what was going on. Um, if, if you look at that map, there's a lot of different colors on it, and I think the pink buildings... Uh, uh, indicate uh, the, the red red buildings or pink indicates a brick building, the yellow a frame building. That may be a fire map. I don't know. That was that was also you know a lot of the fire protection back then didn't come from Layton City. It came from the county. It came out of Farmington. So there's there's uh, uh, this is some of the major industries that came in. Roller mills again they processed lots and lots of of grain for not only animal but human consumption. Uh, the the uh, Woods Cross Canning Company, Layton Woods Cross, they had an outlet in, in actually in Woods Cross, or not an outlet, but a canning facility, but they had one here in Layton that I remember going to. And then uh, and then there was another cannery that popped up in Clearfield called Clearfield Canning. That uh, They were actually in business until almost in the early 1980s. And the Layton Sugar Company, they processed sugar 1905, the building was actually built in two pieces. And uh, <clears throat> I actually became the last owner of the Leighton Sugar Company. Uh, I bought it off the LDS Church back in the uh, uh, 18, or 1980s. And uh, we, we actually turned that into an industrial park. 
wonderful old building but and well built, but it would not have survived an earthquake. The cost of retrofitting this sugar storage room for earthquake would have exceeded by the, the cost of the building by many times. And so we, we've, uh, that's been turned into an industrial park now and uh, it it's, uh, produces a lot of jobs uh, for the community and a lot of revenue for the community. So it's uh, been a pleasure to be associated with that. And I think you're gonna have a, an entire lecture series on the sugar, the sugar business in Layton. It's fascinating. The sugar business in Utah is fascinating. How it got here, came from Germany. Uh, Brigham Young was an instigator. Uh, sugar House is named because of the sugar industry. And I think we'll have a fascinating uh, listen on the on what, what took place with the sugar industry. Um, as soon as people determined that there was a need here to have a city, and it wasn't because they all wanted to just get together and have a great time, people bond together because they had a, they have a need for services. And they needed a culinary water system, but that, that was hard. They, they did it, they did a great job of it, but it was hard because we were scattered out. I remember that the boundary, and we're gonna look at that here in a second, but the boundary of the city is right there. So we go up, we go up the creek, uh, up Rosewood, across, over, cross Antelope, down and down only to where the, 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 most of us will know it as the rail trail. That's the old DNRG rail line. And we only go down west to that point. But everyone west of that point considered themselves as being part of Layton. And uh, even, even to the south and the north of ways, they considered themselves as being in Layton. So as, as Layton's expanded to what is today the largest city in Davis County by far, uh, when I was mayor, we, we had actually, we, we, we had about 25% of the land mass of Davis County was in Layton City. About 25% of the population was in, Layton, was in Layton City. And 25% of the tax base was in Layton City. I would imagine that has changed a little bit, but uh, I think uh, the community is still in an amazing position as far as finances. And the boundaries are pretty well set. That was, uh, those things were accomplished uh, back in the 90s. We pretty well had all the annexations. There are a few tiny places left to come into the community. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think we are approximately, or when we reach total annexation for where we have identified, we will, we will get to, I think, close to 26 square miles. That's a pretty big city. That's a lot of space. And again, it's about a fourth of Davis County. Uh, another thing, just that this is just a note, we, we, f we put in our boundary declaration when uh, back, uh, we had some very astute planners in the community and we had amazing city council as we do now, but we, we included Hill Air Force Base in our boundary declaration. And no one had done that. The city of Gilbert, Arizona did it. We picked up on it. Now, if Hill ever closed, that which heaven forbid, I don't think that will ever happen. But if it did, that Air Force Base is in with the exception of a little bit out on the south end where the base housing is, uh, or on the north end, south end, where the base housing is would turn into, would become part of Layton City. We would have a runway. Um, I'm not sure that will ever happen, uh, but you know, it didn't cost anything to make that move, so. Uh, we're still, uh, if you can look at that map, you can visualize where the city boundaries were uh, back at the time that we've incorporated and became a city. Uh, first Layton city, Lawrence Ellison. Uh, many of us knew Lawrence Ellison. <laughs> uh, George Briggs, E.G. King, William Layton, Leonard Sandal, uh, Wilford uh, Wiggle was the clerk and uh, Verd Cook treasurer and um, all these people, I, I did not know all these people, but I knew, I, I know their posterity well. And they, they certainly set the course right for this community. I think all of you that are here representing the Layton City Council today, I can tell you that, that uh, 
we, we were successful as a city council the time that I served because we had a great success pattern that we could step into. We had, uh, the city was on a sound financial footing. We hadn't barred ourselves into problems where we had to change taxes. And, and, and you've carried on well. This is, we've successfully been able to move forward this community. And it goes clear back to 1920, 100 years ago, when we started this. Population of Layton City in 1920, 529. Uh, the only thing you can be happy about as city councilman is if there was 529 people in this community today, they would all want to talk to you on a fairly regular basis. And because the city has reached the size that it has, we, we haven't got, we were not there. This is Main Street and it's just very interesting. I think the building on, uh, on would, would be again, the large building off to the side, I believe is that would be the canning factory. Um, if you look closely again, I was able to take my, my uh, iPad and just open these things up and take a close look. And it's, a, it's an amazing community. It's amazing where, where we are. I think that's Highway 91 or Main Street in Layton right now we're looking at through this picture or with this picture. Uh, this is Main Street looking north from the Farmers Union building, which is where the First National Bank building uh, was. That was the Farmers Union. You can see that uh, then the tracks used to run through the middle of town. They were moved west uh, at, a, at a later date. I didn't know we had a flood in 1992, but there it is. Uh, I remember in, I think it was 19, 1984, I received phone calls from people in New York because there was water running down Main Street in Salt Lake City and they called and wanted to know if we were okay. Uh, apparently they had the same issue, Kays Creek. Uh, there's, you can still see that it looks like there's mountains or there's snow on those mountains in the background. Probably a year of a very quick melt and caused a flood. Again, there's the, uh, the, the stores, the old downtown. Some of those buildings are still standing. Um, again, Main Street looking north, it's in front of the roller mills. The railroad depot was moved from Main Street. That building had moved, I think, three times or twice. Yeah, built, moved, and moved. And it's, of course, now down on the, just off the Leighton Parkway. Um, Anyway, you can see that railroad building down the tracks there. If you if you look, of course, off to the off to the uh, side of the picture there. Um, again, you look down the tracks, railroad depot uh, moved it west, and it's it's that's a very well built building. That's a I think a very classy building, and I'm glad it's been preserved. Uh, this is an interesting picture. A movie studio. Uh, for, uh, did a movie out on uh, called the Covered Wagon out on Antelope Island, and this is when they came through Layton. And, uh, looks like they must have came up. Uh, uh, looks like they were going down Main Street. Uh, I don't know if they're headed north or south, but they were they moved off of Island, Antelope Island. That's about the same time the city was incorporated. Uh, Wasatch League baseball champions, 1920. So the first year we were a city, I guess they won the championship. I'd like, I, I don't have the names of those players. Uh, I've, I've got a gentleman here that might, but uh, I don't, uh, I, I'll bet there most of them are names that we would quickly recognize their, their last name. Highway 91, I find that interesting, 22 feet wide. If you go down Gentile, down uh, on the west side, across, Gentile, there's 33 feet of pavement on Gentile all the way down. And here there, it's 22 feet wide. So uh, that would be an interesting pass for people. We're just about to the end here. Mountain Road, Highway, that's where Highway 89 is now. Looks uh, like luxury living compared to what's going on up there now. There's uh, a lot of that dirt has been moved and turned over maybe two or three times. There's a lot of equipment up there. Uh, this is the Leighton Central Business District in 1922. Um, this this must have been this is taken from the west, looking east. I don't. A lot of folks don't know where Dawson Street is, but just as you cross it, Union Pacific tracks, the Front Runner tracks, 
if you make a, a very hard left very quickly, you turn onto Dra Dawson Street, goes back down and ties in with Flint Street. And, uh, but that's Dawson. And I, Lake Elementary School, if it were in this picture, it would sit right in the, in the uh, your lower right-hand corner, left-hand corner. Um, and in conclusion, uh, anyway, the town, Layton City built a city hall finally. I don't know where they met prior to that, but uh, they, they must have met someplace, but they built this city hall in September of uh, 1940. It was dedicated, and uh, uh, I've known that building to be many things. It's still in existence. Most of it is still in existence. The three doors uh, off to the right are, or the left are the fire station. It's where that's set, and then, of course, the city hall and city facilities. The city has continually expanded. We've taken areas in West Layton. We've annexed. I was uh, involved on the planning commission when we annexed the, uh, East Layton. East Layton incorporated to a city. It didn't work well, and there was some financial issues, and Layton City adopted East Layton or uh, Laytona. There are, uh, and then we had a, a few boundary disputes over property to the north, but uh, again, we are the largest city in the county by far. We will have the largest population of any place in the county by far by the time we reach build out. And uh, it's been a great place to, it was a great place to be raised. It was a great place to raise a family and it's still a great place to raise a family. Uh, this community is a uh, really, and when it comes to the, to the way to manage and run a city, whether you're in the state of Utah or elsewhere, elsewhere is a is a is a star. It's it's literally it blinks on and off. It isn't just a shining star. It's a, a brilliant star. Uh, we do things here that are well managed. There we elect smart people, and we put people on our city councils that care about our community, and we hire people that care about our community. And it's a great place to live, and I don't want to live anywhere else. I joked with Joyce the other day. She said, she said, you've lived here your entire life. And I, I said, I've never been able to make enough money to leave. The real story is, and she says, you've never wanted to leave. And that's true. I have no desire to be anywhere else. I have my plots up in the cemetery, and uh, this is where I'll be. I thank you very much for this opportunity. This is a, this is a great uh, a great series you've put together. Uh, you might look at a different choice of speakers another time, but uh, I, I found this very fascinating. I, I, I loved what I was able to prepare and the things I was being able to look at, and even the genealogy I was able to look at with my family. As I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a fourth generation here, so fourth, and my children are five. So thank you very much for this opportunity and. And uh, may Leighton be blessed by the good graces and this great country be blessed. Thank you.